Welcome to Lessons Learned. Uh, my name is Obed Figueroa, I'm the host. Uh, and I'm so excited again to bring another practicing physician um, to you uh, so that you can listen and learn uh, from their experiences. So let me begin with the intro. Um, Dr. Uh, Katrina Jean uh, is from the Bronx, New York, and her undergraduate studies, she attended the University of California, Irvine, where she earned a bachelor's of science degree majoring in biochemistry and molecular biology. She also completed a post program at UCLA, graduating with, with a 4.0, bravo. She then went on to enroll uh, in Turo College doctoral program in osteopathic medicine, graduating in 2014. Dr. Jean uh, completed her residency training specializing in family medicine at St. John's Episcopal Hospital in New York, where she served as the department physician resident and is a member of the Morbidity and Mortality Review Committee. She also is board certified by the American Board of Family Physicians. Currently, Dr. Jean is a family medicine physician at New York Presbyterian Medical Group in Queens. She provides care to adults and children and has special interests in cultural competency, urban health, and palliative care practices. She is a member of the American College of Physicians and the American Osteopathic Association and has presented lectures and presentations on various topics in our field. And finally, she's currently enrolled in an MBA program at the University of Massachusetts at Elmhurst, Elmhurst. And we'll learn more about that as, as our discussion uh, continues. So welcome, welcome Dr. Jean. Thank you. So yes, it's been a pretty long journey there. <laughs> yes, it has. My parents immigrated here from Antigua and also my mom is from Antigua. My dad is from Dominica, not wow. the Dominican Republic, but Dominica, the French island. Yes, yes. Wow. I, I didn't know. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I look forward to, to further unpacking a lot of stuff about you and, and all the things you've gone through and, and you know, the lessons you have learned um, so our students can benefit. Um, the audience is a little less than 1,900, um, you know, students that are health science majors, pre-med, uh, undecided that it signed up to my group and linked them. So I released these videos there on the podcast there and they listen and learn. And, and you know, just doing the analytics, we're in several different countries. It's just blowing my mind, Germany, Australia, um, Brazil, um, obviously the United States throughout the States, it's, it's just all over. Canada, um, yes. just looked at that today. Uh, and yeah, so we're, we're reaching them. We're reaching them and I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Uh, for your time. I really am. Thank you. If we could begin, um, so with speed questions, um, you know, we ask a series of questions just to get your first thoughts. We kind of like want to know you beyond the scientists, beyond, you know, your career, um, okay. things about you. So let's begin. Um, PC or Mac? Oh, Mac. Mac. Everything is iPhone. Yeah, Mac. yeah I was going to say that. That was my next one. Yep. Um, so favorite season? Favorite season, I would have to say springtime. Spring, okay. Um, what's your favorite vacation spot? Favorite vacation spot is I would have to say Dominica, which is a small French island. Okay, never been there. Very tropical with like um rainforest there. Mm. A lot of natural stuff, like even like natural waters. Like a lot of the waters are alkaline because they had like volcanoes there before that erupted and now a lot of the water is like alkaline over there. So interesting. Yeah, that's definitely a bucket list of mine. Um favorite restaurant. A favorite restaurant. Oh I would have to say I have quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> um I like this restaurant called Las Brisas in California. It's like off the beach. Mm -hmm. it's a mexican restaurant it's pretty good okay and in the city in new york i would record i say like carmine's it's a oh, that's an italian spot i do that's what it reminds yeah, yeah yeah um so is there a, if you think of food in this way is there a particular dessert or food that you when you indulge in it you just feel a little guilty oh yeah <laughs> which one would that be i would say tiramisu oh, oh yeah. i've heard that I've heard that from others. Okay. Um, favorite TV show? 
favorite TV show? I like to watch American Idol. <laughs> the talent. Yes. Um, your favorite movie? Favorite movie? Oh, it's a long one. I like uh, two actually come to mind. Muhammad Ali and Titanic. Hmm. Muhammad Ali, the movie played by what, Will Smith? Correct. Yes. Oh, you like that before? His, his, okay. All right. Um, do you watch sports? Sometimes. Yeah. Do you have a favorite? I like, I would have to say women's basketball right now. Okay. I, yeah. That, that's a, there's a surgeon in that. I, I see. Um, is there, what's your favorite music genre? I do like R&B. I would have to say in reggae, calypso, soca. Okay. I like a bit of music. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Your favorite color? Favorite color. I have a few favorite colors. I would have to say um, the first thing that comes to mind is like magenta, like hot mm -hmm. pink. And the other one's probably like earth tones. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So the last question. Um do you have a favorite book that you would you wouldn't mind reading twice, if not three times? Um, let me see which book. I've read a lot of books. Anything current? Um, no, because I have an eight-year-old, so I've been reading a <laughs> lot of uh, eight-year-old series. Oh, so <laughs> I send you my book. <laughs> I like Ruby Lou. Um, let me see here. What book would I say that I would recommend? Mm. Or even you know, it's a lot of like science-based books. So hmm. it was like this this physics book that I used to read sometimes. So I think I like like science books sometimes. Okay. Yeah. You're not into like you know, fiction or not nonfiction? No? Both. Not one over the other. Okay. So let's begin with you. Um so if you wouldn't mind, um if I could take you back to your high school time, I would have met, tell me when your first experience was that you started considering the sciences. Did it go that far back? No, I didn't really consider science in high school, but um, in high school, like I did well in, in a lot of classes and everything. And in science, I got, I always got like over a hundred. Mm. That was like, I didn't have any, science like background before like in elementary school we didn't do science so I only started to see science in high school and we didn't even like have lab work it was just only theories gotcha. so chemistry biology physics but it was all theory and um I was did well in those classes so when I went to college I decided to like at the beginning major in science okay understood um, is there anyone at the high school stage where you felt like they made an impression on you that kind of put led you to this direction or, you know, um, or yeah. just influenced you? Oh, I think it was my chemistry teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I always, like I said, I always got over a hundred in chem in sciences, especially like chemistry and in high school mm -hmm. and the chemistry teacher, like he thought that that was pretty good and he did leave an impression on me. And his wife worked there too as like the math teacher. This was like a Catholic school in the city in like 34th Street in downtown Manhattan. Oh, if, if you wouldn't mind, what was the name of the school? St. Michael's. St. Michael's, okay. That's an all girls school. And um, his wife was the math teacher. And it was interesting because even though I was doing well in math, she didn't, she didn't seem to like me that much. <laughs> But the husband liked to like me, and I was like, "Oh man, this is this is gonna be difficult for them when they get home." <laughs> oh wow, well, interesting. But um, yeah, it was interesting. Okay, <laughs> all right. So um, from high school, and then you start to consider going into undergrad. Um, was your family helpful? Had they gone to college um, before you went that direction? Okay, so if you could walk me through that, like you know, so you're at high school and you're considering to go to your undergrad experience, who helped you? How'd you figure that out? Well, it was not our guidance counselor. It was actually like my mom. Yeah. She was um, trying to help me get into like the best school that she thought I could like get into that I wanted to go to. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So we applied to like many different, so I applied to many different schools, but she was there helping me. So I have to say we. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh -huh. um, so that's who helped me in terms of like, where guy helping guide me to go to a certain school and she had never been to college herself before 
and either had my dad. My dad didn't even finish like seventh grade education. Really? Really? Okay. That's amazing that, you know, you and you guys figured it out. You figured it out. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Now, for your undergrad, um, were you able to get in with scholarships? Exactly. So undergrad was very challenging for me because I got in and I got some scholarships with the school. Like I started out at NYU, New York University, and the school was like really expensive. So I had scholarships, but it didn't cover everything. And there was a lot of loans. And also this idea, like my parents, they didn't go to college before. So they had the idea of like, I need to be working full time, like 40 hours, like as soon as I get there. Because <laughs> they were like, we can't afford this and you're in now. So you, you need to work full time. So I was like working full time from the beginning. Uh, as I was going to classes too, trying to figure out how I was going to pay for my education, which led me to eventually transfer to a different school. Um, and then I ended up transferring to, like, I moved to California and went to a community college there that was free. So that's why I tried to help myself to overcome the financial barrier. Gotcha. When you get to, wow, so you went to California, you went there by yourself or you, did you have family there? No, so we don't have too much family there. So I did go by myself. I did meet a friend while I was at NYU who lived there. And um, she was a really good friend. Like in our first year, we like bonded while at NYU and she was from California. Mm -hmm. So and we had a house there. And so if I went out there, since I was planning to go out there, like her family told me like I could stay there and they like gave me like a low rent. Oh, wow. good, good. No, I'm glad you had some supports. Wow. That, that's that's brave of you to, to make that move. Um, and so, I mean, how was that, um, you know, over there going to from New York City to California, culturally for you, how was that? Well, culturally, it was a culture shock because it's so different because I was in like Los Angeles and, and I didn't know because I just moved there. I didn't know much about the place. Uh -huh. But um, like a lot of people there into like acting. <laughs> so it was much different. People didn't care about like, working as much like New York we like hustle and bustle every second and it was like the complete opposite when I got there everything was like many people like laid back waiting for auditions so it was like a whole different uh, type of world but gotcha. I still like, went to campus and went to school so okay. I still have that part too all right so you're an undergrad um and you're the major you declared for your undergrad well at that point, I just did like science generally because mm -hmm. um, I ended up becoming like a respiratory therapist first. Okay. Because I wanted a job. That's why. Gotcha. <laughs> I took all these science classes and then I was certified in respiratory therapy so that I could work at the same time as going to school. Wow. I totally get that, that strategic the thinking that you had there. I, I could see. Okay. That's excellent. Excellent. So you, you got that first. And then was able to make a you know earn some earn some income so that you can support for going further. Correct. Excellent, excellent. So you, um, so then I see for the undergrad, um, you were finishing with the biochemistry and molecular biology. Yes. Yeah, so at the community college, when I first got there, Santa Monica Community College, I was doing well in the sciences. I was able to transfer to like UC, so I transferred to like UC. Irvine at the mm -hmm. time and that's where I majored in biochemistry and molecular biology and also when I got there I did when I went to UC Irvine I ended up getting full scholarship which included my housing and um for books tuition and everything and so I was able to not have to work and then that's when I actually did really well in the upper science courses if and I may yeah if I may if I may interrupt because I, I, I know people, I'm dying to know, and I want people to know, how did you land that situation? And I have assumption that was it because that you had the previous experience and, and certifications and respiratory therapy? What, what, what gave you the leverage to get that uh, extra support financially? I think it was uh, a combination of working and also, so they saw that that certificate was there and then also um, grades because I was like getting a lot of A's at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So I believe it was the grades too that that's how I was able to get the scholarship because the scholarship wasn't something I applied for. It came to me, which is different. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That, that's a blessing. 
that's a blessing. And, and there are definitely lessons there for people. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Thank you so much for, so for I think sharing that. Lesson is just do your best. Just try to do your best and, yeah. you know, let God settle the rest. Actually. Wow. So help me. So when you're in your undergrad, you, when you go from community college to the university, how was that transition for you? I uh, had the transition. Well, now I had the housing and everything. So financially, I had like a little bit of buffer because of the scholarship, which helped mm -hmm. me. So then I was able to just like just concentrate on classes and help start to become a part of the academic community there. Mm -hmm. So then I got involved in mentoring like mentoring for organic chemistry classes that I like took and passed before started becoming parts of like organizations such as some um, science related like organizations like STEM and different things like this. So, and I also mentored there, there was one big organization too called camp. And then actually me and some of my peers there, we started our own organization called aspiring mm. black physicians. Mm. Nice. Nice. If I may ask, um, when you were, when you were going through the transition of you know going from community college to university, did you already have your like study skills in place and how to na navigate that space? Like, did you learn that along the way, or tell me how was that? I definitely didn't. I kind of like navigated that along the way. Study skills like time management that definitely was not in place. I took the MCAT around that time. So that's when I started to learn that like I needed better time management skills and also balancing like academics and um, MCAT, which is different than like school, that's different than if I had work. So just trying to balance things and also trying to concentrate like on the weaknesses too. I started to realize that I used to not just be about my strengths, but realize what my weaknesses are as well to make those better. Got you. And in terms of the weaknesses, if you could share um, at that stage, what did you identify to be the weaknesses and then what did you put into place to help? Okay. So as I, in school, I feel like as an undergraduate major in biochemistry, molecular biology and biochemistry, I was actually pretty strong, like with the science classes. So I started mentoring and everything. And um, it wasn't really those classes. It was more like when I started studying for the MCAT, I felt like the MCAT was more like a weakness because mm -hmm. I wasn't, I don't think I, I took one standardized test before the SAT, now that I'm thinking about it, in my life. So I didn't really know how to study for a standardized test. So I think that that could have been like a weakness. Okay, right. So you're saying it wasn't the coursework at the, at the undergrad level, gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, was there anyone that assisted you with the time management of, you know, of the undergrad or how did you figure that part out? Uh, I didn't really figure that out at that time. It started okay. to figure out when I did that post back program at UCLA. Okay. That's when they had time management people, like specialists there to help you. Okay. They also had MCAT preps. So like they had different tools at that experience that like helped me. Mm -hmm. Is there any nuggets from that program that you could share that that helped you? So I'm, I'm seeing this as an opportunity, like could someone that's listening benefit from that post rat program and what would they benefit from it? How would they okay, benefit? So I remember like when I, I chose to do a post back program to like strengthen my overall GPA because I had some classes from NYU, like physics, for example, that I needed to like strengthen which I did when I was at UC Irvine, but my overall science GPA needed to be even higher, in my opinion. So then I took, that's why I was like, okay, I'll take a post back. And also the main reason for the post back was the MCAT, trying to get some resources to help me and also resources that have helped me identify my own weaknesses. So that's why I chose like to do a post back program. When I got there to the UCLA post back program, um, there was a counselor, the main person there her name was Liz and um she was just crazy about everybody trying to get a 4.0 mm -hmm. <laughs> all right so I mean that was like the culture there oh, uh, wow. so we you know you try your best and it will be what it would be but you know they pushed you to do better was the main thing yeah. and as soon as I got there MCAT so that summer we focused on studying for the MCAT no matter like if you took it before if you never took it 
everybody was like in MCAT classes together throughout the right. summer. Uh -huh. And um, they had people like of color that were like teaching us the courses. And mm -hmm. uh, so that helped too. That was called the RAP program at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the people that were teaching us the for the MCAT, they were only a few years older than us. Huh. Okay. Like much, much older. Right. They had taken it, they were actually in medical school. Okay. Many, so they came back to teach, and many of them had did the program themselves before. Nice. Um, so they helped you to try to get organized to pass that part of the test. Like if it was biological science or physical science mm -hmm. or verbal reasoning or writing, whatever you needed help with, but they did it all comprehensive. Okay. Hmm. And in, in terms of um, beyond the MCAT, that program helped you in what other capacity? Time management. So like specialists, they had specialists try to help you with time management also for reapplying because it was called the RAP program to reapply for medical school so that you could hopefully have done something different than what you did when you first applied. Got you. Okay. Wow. All right. That's good to know. Good to know. Um, and so you went through that program uh, and at, so it's at that point in which you're applying to med schools, you retook the MCAT. I'm, I am curious um, how you viewed your, your own profile and why you thought it was not high enough or competitive enough. What does that look like when you were submitting? What, when you considered your profile to be not um, as strong enough, what, what, what were you looking at? I was looking at like the competitive like MCAT score, for example. Mm hmm that time, which is, is different now, but I was looking at the competitive MCAT score and trying to either get that score or okay. above. That was my goal. Right. So the scoring As opposed to scoring below. Right. So the scoring is different now. Um, the way in which they have it uh formatted. Um, what about your your at your profile, your your um science numbers? You know, you felt it wasn't strong enough. Um, what does strong, you know, what does strong enough look like? Like, where did you want it to be, and where was it? Well, there was at least an upward trend, so I did care about if there was like a downward trend or upward trend. There was an upward trend, and okay. then also um, just um, at least a, at least like a three, hopefully like a three point four or five GPA in the sciences okay. without other classes. Is that really hard to to climb up from? Like if you have a 3.0 and you're trying to get a 3.4, would the post back be enough to, to pull you up there? Or like, what's the strategic thinking? Well, I think I thought like, let me try to, if I could like do well in X amount of classes, like suppose I took like eight classes in this post back or six to eight classes. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, have so on them, right, exactly. And upper level compared to what I was having before, like suppose it was like a 3.0. Right. At least headed in the right direction and showing that you're trying. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. All righty. Um, so, you know, from this post back, and that's when you're starting to apply to the med schools, okay. right? Um, and so, you know, when you were submitting to the med schools, were you, were you considering osteopathic and allopathic both? What was your thinking then? At that time, I was considering allopathic, and um, but then I started to learn. That was another thing. The post back actually helped us to learn more about osteopathic. They brought in different physicians who completed the program who were osteopathic doctors, mm -hmm. and so I learned more about the osteopathic profession there as well. And then also while I was in the hospital, but this all happened more like post back year, not like in undergrad and before. Right. So also, at, when I would start working, like the times when I did shifts, I would notice that there were deals in the hospital because I worked at US USC hospital over there. Mm -hmm. I noticed that some of the physicians were DOs and some were MDs. And you really, when in the work environment, you didn't really know the difference unless you asked the person. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's definitely changed. Even in terms of informing more undergrads, I think you know, 10, 15 years ago, it wasn't as strong as it is now. Now it's it's definitely changed. I think they're more informed, the pre-meds, about osteopathic than 10, 15 years ago. Um, but yeah, okay. All right, so um, at the point in which you're applying, um, 
you know, how is it looking at that stage? You know, are you getting the acceptances the way you want? When I was applying, um, well, I'm, I'm trying to remember when. I feel like it was around January that I started to get acceptance letters. Mm. And um, I did get a few acceptance letters. Yes. And then I chose to go to Toro. Yeah. Because I was from New York originally. Right. And I was actually didn't live too far from there where my mom was from. So it, like it made sense for me. And I was familiar with the Harlem environment. I was actually born in Harlem Hospital. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, this makes sense. So I'm going to go to this school here. I see, because you're from this city, you know, the Toro. Were you contemplating any others beyond Toro? Western. Western University was in California. And actually, uh, there was one, I'm trying to think of, A.T. Still, I remember. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, wow, that, that must have been exciting. You're able to return back to New York. So, I, you know, we, we're, we are the lucky ones for sure. Um, and so you, you know, you head back, I'm sure your family was excited, no? Definitely. Oh, yes. Uh, um, you, you know, you, you start your, your first day as you go to the med school in Harlem. What does that look like for you? Well, that was interesting because it was anatomy as soon as we started, like it was full days of anatomy over the summer. Mm -hmm. And, um, that was with Dr. Rich and, um, it was pretty intense. And even with all the science classes I took, I was biochemistry and chemistry, so I never really took anatomy. I think I took a one intro anatomy class, which was not the same as medical school. <laughs> so, um, you know, I got there and then I just had to make sure to work hard from day one and um, try to learn things, try to learn things fast and try to use those skills too. So I realized like the type of learner that I am, mm -hmm. I, I realized that in the post back too. In also undergrad, like um, at UC Irvine, I think that's when I started to realize I was a, like a visual learner as well as an auditory learner versus a learner who learns by um, reading the words. <laughs> no, understood. So, I mean, you start that curriculum, which is pretty, it's pretty huge and, and fast paced. Um, did you have to go in when you started? Did you notice that you had to change certain things about how you studied and how you time managed? At the doctorate well, level? Actually, there was something big too. Oh, I didn't mention. Yeah. So in terms of like, I liked, I remember when I first entered college, I liked to study on my own a lot. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think it was because possibly like when I was in high school, none of my high school friends like came with me to where I was going and I didn't like know many people there. I don't know why, but I always like, like to study by myself, but that was something I learned in the post back. Like you didn't, this is not for you to be studying by yourself. We actually do this as a group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so once I got to Toro, I made friends immediately. And, and so I had a group of friends and then we learned together. Excellent. So yeah. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. I was going to ask you, so that was a, that was a, the change she made and that, that helped you with your success. Mm -hmm. um, what was your favorite part of the, the first two years? Was there any particular parts you, you favored? Oh, yeah. My favorite part was actually like biochemistry and pharmacology. So mm -hmm. things that had to do with my major seemed to be my favorite parts. Yeah. Okay. And then you go, you know, your first and second year, you move on. Um, how was, how'd you feel about walking towards the step one? You know, how was that for you? Actually, I was like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> it was not fun. Like, I'm like, here we go with the standardized test. But now I was like, hopefully thinking that like, maybe I have some tools in my toolbox <laughs> from the post back program that can help me with the step one. Yes. Mm. Um, with your second, um, excuse me, your third and fourth year, you now you're in the hospitals. Um, was there any particular, you know, locations that you really favored you enjoyed? Actually, I... You know, I like the hospitals, but remember after working as a respiratory therapist, I was like used to being in the hospital. So I knew how to like, like maneuver there. Mm -hmm. So um, one of my favorite locations was one in Jersey, like right across the bridge, mm -hmm. Palisades, so the Palisades Hospital. And um, that was one of my favorite locations mm -hmm. that I wrote. And what, what uh, specialty or what, what was the focus there at that place for you? 
you actually had, I did quite a few specialties over there when rotating. So I did internal medicine, yeah. which was one of my favorite. And um, also surgery, we did mm. surgery there. And also I did family medicine, but it was the clinics there versus the hospital. Which mm -hmm. So I did a few rotations there and neurology too. And if I were to ask you, um, I know you chose family medicine, but I just wondered through your clinic rotations, was there any particular specialty that you were like, hmm, like maybe I might consider, like what, which one was that? Oh, I started out wanting, I remember when I first got this horror, I was planning to do like anesthesia. Okay. That's what I was doing, anesthesia. So I went to a few conferences and everything, mm -hmm. but the reality, because I had a, a child in my last year of school, in medical school, then I decided to go into family because of the hours. So the hours were different. Mm -hmm. And I actually enjoyed like being in a hospital too, like working like a hospitalist. Mm -hmm. Family medicine. So even with working, when I went to New York Presbyterian, I worked in Westchester mostly. And besides doing outpatient, I also did work in the hospital too. So I worked in a hospital too. I took a few shifts over there mm -hmm. and also worked in a nursing home. So it allowed me to like do multiple wear multiple hats, not just do one thing. And that was actually one of the reasons why I had chose that job because they told me like I could do a few different things there. Got you. With, um, hmm, is there anything- like the, hours were, the hours are like 8.30 to 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. So it's different. Yeah, so you finish your, you know, your third and fourth year. Um, so t I guess tell me about that stage. Now you're at your in your fourth year. You're getting ready to, to apply to residency. What does that look like for you? Fourth year. So, well, fourth year. A lot of times you're looking. You also besides rotating at the hospitals, like you're learning. You're trying to see which place is a good fit for you. So some you pick your rotations based on that. Also, letter of recommendations. You're thinking about letters for when you do apply for the match and getting to know the different people who are writing your letters, that's for sure. And also mm -hmm. like medical directors, the program. So it's a lot of like talking to residency program directors as well. So it's quite a bit of work. Okay, so you, you land your residency in family medicine. Um, and you're at, what is that, uh, St. John's, right? St. John's Episcopal, am I right? All right. Um, the, I am curious about, um, you know, when you're at that stage, um, you know, what was some of the pros and cons you at that stage that you experienced in residency? In residency, um, let me see what the pros were. Well, I was hoping to like be somewhere like close to home. Mm -hmm. So I'm my residency at St. John's in Queens, and I'm hoping to like get a job close to home too. Hopefully, mm -hmm. that was one of my goals, and um. Also a place that where you're like, hopefully you're like a good fit too. So meeting people, meeting the people there as well. And um, seeing what you bring, what are your strengths as you work as a resident, like a medical resident, what are your strengths that you have that you bring to the table and where it will be a good fit for your strengths? And, you know, I was going to ask you, you, there's an assumption with New York City um, and, and rightly so, we're, we're very diverse. Um, and so I'm wondering, and you know this because you were raised here, um, mm -hmm. but, but I'm wondering in your, in your professional experience, you know, are you finding, you know, diversity within your profession when you're in these environments? So do you find that even though we're in within New York, you, you tend to still be the minority within the spaces you're in? I'm exactly. asking. So I am still the minority within the spaces that I'm in. Okay. And, um, I'm I'm actually a little surprised. Like I would think that there will be more doctors of color and hopefully that's that'll be the goal for especially New York, like in the future. Because mm -hmm. in family medicine, even where I am, New York Presbyterian Queens, Queens is a very diverse place. And as a family medicine physician, I am the only person who is African American there who's black. And um uh, in family medicine specifically right. versus surgery or gynecology or another specialty. Hmm. Yeah. And when I was in Westchester, there was only one other, one other um, primary care doctor who was, who was black as well. 
-hmm. in okay. family medicine. And family medicine is the forefront of who's yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how do you, I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, m many of us experience experience this, you know, and, and you know, being the only sometimes, um, how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you mentally deal with that? Um, how do you remain who you are and just, you know, how do you get your needs met? How do you, you know, tell me how you deal with that. Well, there's a few ways. So me, for myself, I try to like um, teaching. So there's ways that you can like be a mentor there. It's optional. Some people don't want to do it. Some people want to do it. But in my case, like I feel like I'm more wanting to do it because I could try to help others like get in that way, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And um, or at least let them see that there's someone else there too who's of color, so mm -hmm. that when they go on, then they they'll be aware that there's others there too. Yes. You know something I, I have to share this because I remember from a, another interview um with an osteopathic female physician of color, um, she had said there was one day that she was really feeling low in med school. And, and, you know, just, you know, the pressure of it and, you know, she was pushing through, but just, you know, one of a few. And she said she passed by, in, in passing, she passed by a physician, a woman physician of color. And she, this woman just gave her a minute and looked at her and could tell. And she turned to her and said some kind words. I can't even remember exactly, but I remember what the feeling she conveyed, but it, but it was that moment that she was uplifted because this woman didn't even know her, but could see and relate to her stage and said kind words of inspiration to her. And that carried her, that carried her and still stays with her 30, 40 years later. You know, a simple moment of, you know, just a check in, like, you know, and I, I'm here, I, I got you, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. I, I thank you for that. Cause it's, it's absolutely necessary. Um, with all the pressures that we face. And so that that's good. Um, okay, so tell me, I'm, I'm curious. Um, so with that, I didn't mention that in my bio, but um, yeah, so teaching credentials. So I was actually in Westchester, I did teach, I was one of the faculty for Columbia mm -hmm. medical students. And while I'm at um, Queens right now, I am faculty right now for Cornell PA, the physician assistant program. So oh, we do have is that nice. Our nice. Oof, okay, your time. Ooh, I appreciate the minute you're giving me. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. You're busy. Um all right. So you are, you know, practicing um over at the New York Presbyterian Medical Group in Queens. Um, could you get give us a what does your day look like? All right. So when I first go in, well, first of all, I am some days are virtual and some days are in office. Nice. So we do have telemedicine days, especially like during COVID and after right now, we do do a lot of telemedicine visits. So mm -hmm. about, I would have to say about at least 20 to 30% of my week is virtual. Nice. And um, so Mondays, I work from home when I wake up. Mm -hmm. I, you know, get my child ready for school and everything and then I start working but it's online and our medical assistants I usually work with like a staff like um front like a receptionist secretary is in the front we mm -hmm. also have like office managers and then we have medical assistants or nurses that work with us too and there are nurse practitioners too that work with us at times gotcha uh and so the, the days that you're in what does your day look like so usually I see around like 15 to 20 patients a day. And um, I first come in, I talk to the staff for a while. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then I usually get started after that. And then you're seeing like patients, patient with different type of uh, medical conditions, such as like hypertension or diabetes or cholesterol problems. Or some people are just there for their physicals and they don't really have too much going on so they have different like type of needs got you and for any kind of specialty needs then you refer them out oh yeah we give a lot of referrals too especially just because of like prevention so if someone is like if there's like a female and she's like 50 years old and she does get a referral for like mammogram she gets a referral for like a gynecologist making sure that she has her like checkups with her 
gynecologist to check for pap smears, like in terms of cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. Then we also give them the referral too to like a specialist for colon cancer screening. So just based off of like gender and age, you already have a few referrals like when you're leaving just because the prevention, like we're trying to prevent certain cancers. Mm -hmm. So if I may ask you, um, is it what you thought it would be? If you were to reflect back to when you were in med school, aspiring for this, is it is it what you conceptualized? Well, it's not quite what I conceptualized because I conceptualized more time with patients okay. as I'm just like they used to do before, but now things happen like much faster. So it's not as much time given with the doctor and the patient. Mm -hmm. At certain places, some places are trying to like, uh, change that so that especially if someone's like an older person that hopefully like they get more time mm -hmm. but um so that's one thing that's different to me and second is um electric like basically emr so like the emr systems have we, we're actually going into ai right now at our system mm -hmm. so artificial intelligence so in terms of like um it it's very uh, advanced i do like that part but it is advanced yes Got you. Um, and so that's, that's helping you, you know, with the paperwork. Is that correct? Yes, definitely. So it's, we don't have any paperwork anymore. And um, because we use something called the Epic system and it's an IT system. So we already started using that, but now on top of that, they're going to start using like artificial intelligence too. Gotcha. Wow. Okay. Uh, then your day usually ends about what, what time would you say? Well, it was different at different times. So when I first started being a doctor, I actually did not get home until almost like nine o'clock at night every night <laughs> because it took me more time to realize what was happening in my first couple of years of being a physician. Mm -hmm. And um, and then too, I also worked like Saturdays too. So I was at work a lot. And um, But now that I've had a much, like more under control, I'm able to get home around 6 30 and that's after my day ends at four but okay. i've seen like an extra like hour hour and a half just to return phone calls and then i go home gotcha okay wow wow i do appreciate your time honestly um is there anything that you would want to share with any any of the, the audience anything you think is important uh, i think there's a couple things so first is um if you have financial barriers um challenges I think uh, that you should think of like a strategic way to possibly help yourself with the financial barriers, whether it's scholarships, like applying for more scholarships or um, something else could be, because I'm just thinking about time. So especially studying for the MCAT. One thing I didn't realize before was that like you have to invest time into studying for that MCAT. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's how it was for me. I, let, let's see what others think too. Mm -hmm. But I felt like I didn't realize that I needed to put like so much time into studying for the MCAT, like at least 30 to 40 hours a week. Of I think looking back, I always think that it's best for you like not to work while mm -hmm. you are studying. Like if you know that you want to be a physician, you should try not to work because the MCAT. So like because you have to study for a test that's going to require a lot of your time that standardized exam, then I think that is the best. And also you want to do your best. So in terms of working, working could basically bring your grade from like an A to a B. Mm -hmm. So you could have been an A student, but you've invested time in working and making money. So now your grades are coming lower. So I think like looking back at everything, I actually always advise people if they're able to like not to work. Okay. Yeah. Because that's taking up time. And mm -hmm. time is the one thing we all don't have enough of. Mm -hmm. So with that, like, just don't even, if you want to be a physician, concentrate on that and just try to just streamline it. Hopefully you don't have to work. And so I, I've always heard, you know, during med school, like it is absolutely not practical to consider working at all during med school. Would you agree? Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> After all that work and I did, I realized like, you know, you can't work and get the best grades, you know, and get the best MCAT score and everything you want to do there. So, and especially yeah. medical school, because everything's happening so fast. It's a lot of information in a short amount of time. So mm -hmm. 
yes. So I, de- I didn't, wasn't able to work during medical school. Yeah. Okay. All right, Dr. Jean, I appreciate you so much. Um, this concludes, you know, the episode and, and I'm very grateful for all that you've shared and your honesty with the audience. So thank you so, so much. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. And I hope this affects somebody's life where they're able to do better on their journey in medicine. Absolutely. Absolutely.